Welcome everybody to the Microsoft Teams for Education IT Pro Track Day. Thank you for joining us here. We are happy to have you back if you were with us yesterday. And if you're here today uh, for the first day, well, welcome and we're excited to have you. Again, this is our digital learning with Microsoft Education and this is day two IT Pro Track. If you're looking for the teaching and learning track, please check your email again and make sure to join that event. We've got two simultaneously going on of teaching and learning and IT Pro. We've got tons of great content for IT Pro though here today. My name is Max Fritz. I am a senior program manager with the Microsoft Teams engineering team. Uh, really excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Cloud Chirpa. Always happy to interact with you and get in touch uh, and talk to you guys about all the great stuff we're doing in Microsoft Teams for education. A little bit of a preview of what you're gonna learn about today. So our agenda for the day is packed with tons of great content. We're gonna start off today with this welcome keynote that you're in right now. If you joined us yesterday, it's gonna be some of the same content, but feel free to stick with us because we are gonna be joined by Michael Linehan, one of our cybersecurity experts at Microsoft, of learning how cybersecurity and Office 365 work together to make sure that you can use Teams in a secure way. We're then gonna hear about App Platform and Microsoft Teams and some of the best ways that you can integrate Teams with your existing processes, workflows, and applications that you already use. After that, we're gonna take a good 15 minute break, stretch your legs, anything that you need to do, go grab a coffee, drink a water. And then we are going to talk about some of the great app templates we have for Teams so that you can customize Teams with some pre-built templates to enhance your processes. After that, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about SharePoint and some of the awesome new templates that have been put out for education and the SharePoint Spaces feature. And that'll be done by Devjani. And then you get me again at the end of the day to learn about professional development with Microsoft Learn. And we'll close it out, do a quick survey, and uh, give you guys a few resources to take home with you. We really appreciate you spending your time with us. Whether you're watching this as a recording or you're joining us here live today, this is meant to be an exciting day for you. It's interactive as much as possible. There are activities and sessions as well and tons of links to resources. Now, the number one question that we get throughout the day today is, where can I get the slides? The slides are available at aka.ms slash teams edu live dash slides. You're gonna see this link throughout the day today. It'll be in the announcements. They will be there after the event is done today. So uh, they're posted there after the event for your reference. Don't worry if you go there and you don't see them quite yet. So to set the scene for what we're gonna talk about today, we host this event to focus in on preparation for the next academic year and really making sure digital tools are effectively being used to support you know, those remote and hybrid scenarios that you guys are all looking at and helping to share real best practices and the latest information with you. The impact that this new, uh, new education environment has had on students is really large. And we've got several reports that help highlight the gap, the digital skills gap, uh, that is gonna be essential for preparing for the workplace. Not only proficiency with tools in academic life, but also the transition to the working world, especially now with the work being done online or remote for the foreseeable future. I'd encourage you guys to check this out at aka.ms slash hybrid learning 0365, the letter O, uh, the link is uh, at the bottom right of your screen for a report that we've got on hybrid learning with Office 365 and Microsoft Teams to learn more about this digital skill gap and how you can address it using some of this technology. Now, let's take a moment to just pause in time here with some of the statistics that we announced in April of 2020. April of 2020 was one of the, one of the biggest boom times for us with Microsoft Teams with this giant transformation to remote learning. And we see huge numbers with all the remote learning and expect to see even more this upcoming fall with the continued remote learning. We recently released a blog that we actually called Two Years of Change in Two Months. And that's exactly what we're seeing. The current situation has been accelerated with digital transformation and it's essentially transformed how we work and interact and learn. In that blog, we shared some interesting stats around Microsoft Teams, including 103, excuse me, 183,000 institutions using Teams for EDU, 
75 million daily active users of Microsoft Teams across the world and 4.1 billion meeting minutes in a single day. And a few key things to share of why I'm bringing up these statistics is because we are committed to this platform to make sure that it is there for you, that it works for you, and that it fits what your needs are in an educational environment. And know that you're not alone. This is a focus that Microsoft has across the board. Now, what is Microsoft Teams? Well, the way we design the product is it's meant to be a single hub which covers all the aspects of an educational institution. There's a class template to support teaching and learning, but Teams can also be used to support professional development communities and administrative use cases like meeting with the project management team, uh, co-authoring of financial documents, or new onboarding for employees in HR. Whether it's communication or collaboration internally or externally, the platform of Microsoft Teams minimizes contact switching and increases productivity. It's not designed to replace systems at your institutions like the critical LMS, student information system, or even CRM, but instead it's meant to work with and integrate those into a single platform which can be used across the entire population. One hub bringing everything together. The idea for a hub for your institution isn't just something we say for fun though. It's not vaporware, it's actually quite real. And we've got an example here from the University of Texas Arlington. Uh, we're gonna show a video real quickly here. I've gotten to watch this video a few times. It's quite amazing and I'm really excited to share this with you. Here at UT Arlington, we have a huge population of students, not only in our region, but we also serve students that are online. Not only do we have diversity in terms of where the students are, but diversity in terms of ethnicity and race and age, and also in terms of abilities. For us to find tools that can help us stay in communication in a very efficient way, it's really important, and Teams allows us to do that. Before Teams, we were using Zoom, Slack, email, Jabber, a whole bunch of tools to try to interact. It was fairly ineffective to collaborate like that. You have to think about how do we make it easy for the students and faculty, administrative people to communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. We had had so much change at UTA on the technology front, there was this concern there'd be fatigue on the campus and they wouldn't want to deal with Teams. Once we had access, it's so easy to use that people caught on right away. Teams allows us to have chats between each other. The video portion and the video conference is huge. You can store materials, files, videos, images. Everything is in one place. Teams fully integrated in with Microsoft Office Suite. We can still go back into the channel and we can find the file that we have been working on and we can even collaborate as a group my information is encrypted. I can move it to any kind of cloud service that I want to. With all of this product consolidation, we've been able to drive our costs down while improving our quality of service. How do we intend to use Teams for the future? It's just gonna grow. The features keep coming. Teams is bringing a whole suite of things to us that we didn't really have an easy way to get to before. We're able to now work on problems, issues, and future plans for the campus much more efficiently. Partnering with schools like UT Arlington is really amazing for us to see what kind of transformation we can do. Now we have another case study here from the University of South Florida, which shows leveraging technology in academia, but this time for a medical school. This is a really interesting case study that takes things from a slightly different ex example, and I'm excited to share this with you as well. By this year, 2020, medical knowledge is doubling every 73 days. Every moment we spend with them has to be high value. We have to really be training master learners, not master memorizers. When we had the opportunity to build this new facility, it really gave us an opportunity to rethink medical education. We wanted to build a technology platform in a building that would support uh, potentially decades of innovation in the future. When you have active learning and you're engaging their mind, we know that they don't have to study as much later. So anything that you can do 
to make that material easier to grasp, um, I think is really important. But it was critical that we knew we were using technological tools that were perfect fits to that pedagogic theory, that educational theory, and that led naturally to Microsoft. Our initial design in this building was actually very traditional. We had uh, monitors on the walls around the classrooms. We moved away from that. We pulled the technology into the room and used Surface Hub 2s to really build a platform that could move throughout the building. Hubs could be used um, in a conference room, they could go up to a director's office, or they could stay there and, and support the learning in that space. The building has been designed in terms of space with lots of small group learning, technology infused within those to allow for collaborating around hubs and whiteboards, etc., exactly as we envisioned. The Surface Hub is intended for you to interact with, and so the layout of a room is completely different to encourage adoption of that technology. We have an experiential learning lab on the third floor of the building where the walls can actually be moved around and you can construct whatever space you need. Trying to make things more engaged, more active. Technology creates behavior and space enables behavior. And so bringing those two things together to really um, help focus on uh, adoption of technologies. That students be able to uh, join in into a classroom experience no matter where they are. And we selected Microsoft Teams for that. You can be in multiple small group sessions uh, simultaneously. You can be um, in your lab and teaching a small group. It expands and leverages our faculty in a way that makes it much more efficient. Vision for Teams really is to deliberately allow more synchronous and asynchronous learning. Embedded into our DNA is this concept of continuous quality improvement. Understanding how the human brain works and understanding how we learn more efficiently and effectively, again, leveraging technology. Being innovative is really about how do you simplify? Delegate to the computer world what should be delegated to the computer world, and then what happens is then the human beings have the time, space, energy to be doing the things that human beings are really good at. So again, that was a great case study showing not only how teams can be used in higher education, but higher education combined with healthcare and utilizing some fantastic devices right with that. For those of you who are in the K-12 space in uh, working with students at that age, I don't want you to think that uh, you are left out. This isn't just for higher education. We've got a great quote from the CIO of Duval County Public Schools here from Jim that says that the thing that he really likes is knowing that they have the ability to shift on a dime to online learning if it's required for any situation. So again, what we've seen is Microsoft Teams is one hub where everyone's connected and one hub where everything is connected. It starts with communications. Teams replaces some of the legacy functionality that you might be used to, having the ability to secure chat, have online meetings, and collaboration bringing in the other office apps allowing your group to work on the same document. Microsoft Teams isn't just about Microsoft apps though. This is the modern Microsoft. This isn't your grandpa's Microsoft. It's an open, extensible ecosystem allowing for you to add hundreds of applications to your team's environment. This is the app store that you're used to on your phone, but brought to Microsoft Teams. The experience you have with your phone with never downloading an app from the store how much would your experience lag in comparison to what you're using today on your iPhone or your Android? Apps like Adobe Cloud, ServiceNow, Zendesk, Trello, all these sorts of things. When we say Microsoft Teams for Education, the last part is enhancing teaching and learning scenarios of apps like Flipgrid, OneNote Class Notebook, Wakelet, and many more. So what we want to really do is bring all of this together to help you connect these different things. There was a case study done a couple years ago that's quite interesting that talks about context switching and the taxation it has on the brain. When a student or an educator has to switch between different applications, it takes a toll mentally and it breaks up the stream of concentration. And by bringing all of this together in one location, not only can you make it easier to access and make things easier on your students and your educators, but you can also help improve the retention and the attention that students will have when learning. Now, 
this is a lot of stuff all in one place. And we're here in the IT Pro admin track. So let's talk a little bit about how we can achieve this kind of a scale using Microsoft Teams. And for this, we're going to look to the University of East London. This video that we're about to show is going to show how University of East London went all in with Teams, enabled their students to do self-governance and self-create Teams, allowed for Office 365 governance to really control everything, and automatically created three thousand plus class teams with the proper content that needed to be there, allowing students to have a space to collaborate that's safe and manage that life cycle efficiently. Let's take a quick look. Hi, my name is Janelle Ursu, and I will be talking to you about how the University of East London automated the creation of Team for Class based on our student record system and linked Teams with Moodle and other resources at UEL and thus making Teams a single gateway where students access their required resources. The use of Teams at UEL was initially an IT initiative to promote and encourage communication and collaboration within the department, but we have rapidly acknowledged the potential of the platform in both professional teams as well as teaching and learning due to its deep, seamless integration with Microsoft 365 tools, safe environment for our students and colleagues, to engage for synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning and scalable and adaptable, making it very easy to use on uh, different platforms, mobile or otherwise. As we started to learn the platform's capabilities, we started to think how we can utilize Teams as a learning and teaching tool and how we can do so with very little disturbance to faculty and students. We have over 3000 modules running at different levels. If this was to work, we were not going to ask for these to be created manually. We had to think of a way to automatically create these, link it to our VLE and other resources students may need to access throughout their journey at the university. At that time, the integration between Teams and Moodle didn't offer what we were really planning to achieve. We wanted to create a team for class, automatically enroll the teaching team and every student registered for that module. But we wanted this process to be a dynamic one. Students may change their modules, drop out, teaching teams may change without much notice, and so on. So we needed to create a system that will dynamically manage the membership for every team. Enter MuleSoft, an enterprise bus service that made all of this possible, linking our student information system, our VLE and the graph to ultimately talk to each other and deliver what we wanted, automatic creation of teams for class and dynamic membership management. Of course, this was not plug and play. Last but not least, we relied on the skills of our integration specialist and other colleagues to make it all happen. So how does it all actually work? In SITS, in every module record, there is a flag which tells the integration engine that this particular module needs to have a team. There is a scheduled process that queries the SITS database for any module that has this flag and looks for modules that do not have a team created. For all modules in SITS database without a team record in the integration database, create a team record for this module flagged as new. For all records in the integration database ready for processing, an API is called to check if a Moodle site exists for that module. If it exists, a team is created which is based on a predefined template and the graph API is called to add all relevant tabs and channels and flag these as having been created. A Moodle tab is added using a website tab pointing at the URL of that respective module, as well as other resources. When the lockdown occurred, we were only a few days away to actually implementing this system, and we were able to make this happen very quickly, creating over 3,000 teams and added thousands of students and staff automatically to these teams over a weekend. We primarily created inactive teams, giving the teaching staff time to prepare content and get the team ready. When ready, the module leader would simply click on the activate button and students would start being enrolled. If a Moodle site did not exist, a team would not be created but added to a queue where it would be checked again in a few days. All create requests to the Graph API are tracked and flagged in the integration database so it can be picked up where it left off when the Graph API calls are throttled or fail for whatever reason. Once the modules were created, Intensive training went on. 
I have personally trained over 600 professional and academic staff, as well as approximately 1,000 students on how to work, teach and learn remotely using Teams in a couple of weeks. Of course, this training was delivered using Microsoft Teams. What you are seeing now is a team created by our integration engine with the name of the team matching that of the record in SITS and Moodle, and with the channels and tabs easily directing students to library resources, study skills, and Moodle, as well as the default tabs that a team for class comes with. Below, you will see the integration engine at work, having removed a user from the team automatically. Once the user clicks on the Moodle tab, they will be directed to the respective Moodle site without having to leave the Teams environment and using SSO, single sign-on, they will be admitted to the site without having to sign in again. It has been recognised that students could very much benefit from using Teams fully and therefore we have allowed them to create their own Teams and invite their peers, of course all based on clear governance and policies to control the number of inactive Teams and maintain a tidy household. They have embraced this fully and since the lockdown they have created their own community to cope with the situation and stay in touch. At the University of East London it has been agreed that a blended learning approach will be used in the upcoming academic year with Teams being the platform used to deliver the online element, record lectures via stream, communicating via chat and team posts and use Teams as a research tool. This slide gives you an idea of the usage of Teams at the University with just under 15,000 active users, over 9,000 active channels, all in approximately 6,000 Teams in total, and just under 50,000 meetings organised to point to just a few stats in the last 90 days. The platform has seen a huge uptake from staff and students in the last few months and will continue to do so in the years to come as more and more features are delivered. Thank you. All right, so we're going to close things out here and move on to the new content for today. Again, uh, this keynote was uh, a repeat of the keynote yesterday, and uh, thank you for everybody who's joining us for the first time today. If you were with us yesterday, we're going to move on to the new content in just a moment here. I want to quickly review that we have re released a ton of features throughout 2019 and the first half of 2020, and gosh, we're almost done with the, uh, the third quarter of 2020, and I'm going to have more stuff to share there. Uh, recently released stuff. We've got some great features that I know everybody's been looking forward to, like 7x7 seven seven video and together mode, 300 attendees, translations on mobile, and tons and tons more. There's also some great features in our bookings application for allowing easy management of booking of appointments for any purpose and accessing SCORM, APIs, and rich learning resources using the Go One application. Some features that I know everybody's looking forward to breakout rooms, student lobby, hard audio, mute, and tons more are all coming to Teams very soon. There was a blog post a few weeks ago. You can check it out at aka.ms slash Teams edu July 2020, link at the bottom. So in summary, Teams is that one hub that you can go to for communication and collaboration, connecting people across different areas of education or any other scenario where teamwork might be required and letting you connect all sorts of things together into one platform. With that, we're going to move on to our next content here and get started with learning a bit about cybersecurity in Office 365. I've got the pleasure of introducing you to my good friend and cybersecurity expert, Michael Linehan, who's going to carry us on. And good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Michael Linehan. I am the uh, principal security architect for U.S. Education, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about some individual ways that we can secure access to our institutions, whether we're at K-12 or higher education, um, what we see as the landscape kind of moving forward and you know what we see as current real challenges within the organizations that we have in this ever-changing landscape. Some of the challenges that we see today more than any um, really a, a a line around the network itself being completely gone, um, the resources that we have either completely and wholly existing in the cloud or having moved to the cloud recently, and then an explosion of 
BYOD devices, new devices for students, faculty and staff to access and, and gain access to the resources that that they need to both learn, gain their education, um, as well as provide that content from a teaching and a learning standpoint. Uh, where we see all of this coming together is really in the identity landscape, and that's not an easy component to really understand and take it taking that into account. Um, you know, we have people that are in G Suite. We have people that are coming from Facebook. We have people that are within our Office 365 environment, and and this isn't just faculty, staff, students. This is contractors. This is partners from a research organization and a research institution standpoint. Um, other commercial entities, you know, government entities, you know, they're coming from all over. And how do, how do we look at that landscape as it's kind of changing and really provide a, a clear path forward that allows for a, a comprehensive approach to security, but more importantly an ease of access and we're not reinventing the wheel whenever we have to add a new user or add a new use case in um, or partner or partner with another institution and so as we look at this approach and, and how we see microsoft's approach to this actually falls under quite a few different components but it really it, it lives on the identity um, it lives with Azure Active Directory, and it's a very comprehensive approach um, from an identity and an access management platform um, where we allow you to be highly mobile, um, engage with people outside of your organization. Uh, we have the acceleration and integrations of thousands of applications that are default in our galleries, in addition to bringing your own applications to the game. And then we're giving you that that comprehensive look from a, a security and a protection and a government of act and governing the access controls that we have to really kind of bring that all together. And I've already probably said it twice. I'm going to say it again. Identity is that new control plane, and that's what we see as being kind of the 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 key and the cornerstone, if you will, of digital transformation and. We see that evolving out into things that aren't necessarily part of the Microsoft organization, um, but really a part of integrations with with other cloud providers, with other people like ServiceNow, Box, Dropbox, G Suite, which I kind of already mentioned, our Office 365 platform, the level of integration that we have and integrating identities both within our Office 365 and our Azure AD environment and outside organizations and outside connections into products like Teams um, really gives you a very clear and concise way to move forward, to have a, a, a ton of power um, and, and be very dynamic in the way that you transform and how you integrate. Um, and that and that moves across the devices as well. That moves across, you know, tons and tons of components, whether we talk IoT, we talk, you know, the the individual teaching landscape, um, like Max had referenced in the in the previous session, um, you know, the the capabilities to take rostering information and and populate user groups into something like a student data sync methodology to, to generate and automate thousands of groups being created in a secure and a clear and a concise manner is, is, is extremely powerful and a really cool story to see. Uh, the strong authentication components that we have um, when we get into kind of the, the brass tacks of, of really what strong authentication is needed, what is required. Um, there are a number of different ways on how we can actually secure environments. And I don't think anything um, is more important than having some level or some way to use multi-factor authentication or securing the environments with known devices. And we look at statistics and it's, it's year over year. The, the attacks are becoming more and more focused on you know, leaked passwords, credentials being stolen, social engineering campaigns that are tricking our end users into you know, surrendering their password or their credentials and gaining access in those same workflows to the resources that, that they were expected to um, be clicking on as a result of that engineering campaign. And, and having multi-factor isn't a go kind of a best practice anymore, it's a must have. 
And, and there are a ton of other methods, and I want to talk about a couple of them um, as it fits into our zero trust access. But, you know, the the 99.9% .9 of protection um, can have a number of different flavors there. And, and we see things even from the, the limiting the control and the access uh, from a strong authentication standpoint into things like a zero trust framework and a zero trust methodology. And this isn't anything new. This is something that's been along and been around now for over a decade. But the approach that Microsoft takes and the tools that we have to secure this level of access to secure these capabilities is really world class. And, and the scale of what we see from a telemetry, from an investigation standpoint, um, that enrichment of not only you bringing your users and your information from a user and a device standpoint into that environment, but the signals that we have from things like our intelligent security graph, um, some of the machine learning calculations and components that we can do around identity protection, those dark web lookups to say, hey, not only is that credential become compromised, but we're actually seeing this on the dark web. And oh, it's not just that your username is out there, it's that your password actually matches. And those are very, very strong signals and very compelling components where we can actually go in and take you know, an evaluation based on your organizational policy. And I think that's the core to the zero trust user access. It isn't a rip and replace. It's not a replacement for what you're doing. It's an augmentation and actually an increase in your organizational policy and framework to really foster the adoption that we're looking for and to, to make those decisions when we see something like the leaked credentials or we see something that looks very, very suspicious and we can use the automation if you want to enforce that policy to require a user to actually use MFA or to use a self-service password reset because we have seen those credentials on the dark web. And so we're remediating in line with signals in the telemetry. And that's really where we need to get to in, in a phase of and in the landscape of cybersecurity is the confidence to say, these are my playbooks. These are my organizational policies. This fits within a framework that we have the tools to leverage and the information to make a rich and informed decision. And if I see this, why am I waiting for somebody to click the approve button when I know that it can be done within the system and the environment? And that decision tree and that organizational policy is absolutely a component that is a core functionality to not only zero trust, but a modern security platform in the cloud for not just Microsoft applications, but for all of the applications that you're connecting, but whether they're on-prem or they're in the cloud or they're coming from a third party, there's a lot of things that we can do to take your organizational policy and either whitelist access, restrict access, block access to applications based on risk, based on just simple policies in the way that we actually access components. And so when we have remediation paths built into that and we have the ability to score and do attestation of risk within that decision tree, it's a very rich and very robust environment that isn't taking you down the path of, I see this alert, now they're compromised, now I'm gonna go do something, right? That's the firefighter mentality that we have. But if we if we take it into the, the concept of becoming that fire marshal, I know my policies, I apply my policies based on the information that I get. And that same alert that I was using as a method for firefighting, I'm now using as a method to restrict access or prompt for multi-factor authentication or require some sort of additional step up within that environment, both in a K-12 and in a higher education manner is extremely powerful. If we start looking at and break in and kind of double click in, if you will, into multi-factor authentication, um, you've probably seen if you're looking at the slides a few times that we we really treat and we see Windows Hello for Business within the Windows 10 framework as a core component that actually satisfies the components and, and satisfies, you know, the multi-factor authentication requirement. Um, you know, if we look at the definition of what multi-factor authentication is, it's something you know, something you have, or who you are. And that Windows Hello for Business, that PIN, 
is something you know in addition to something you have, which is specific to that device and specific to that endpoint. And, and that is a unique pin to that device that signs you in in a secure manner into the cloud. That is, that's multi-factor authentication. And, and we don't necessarily have to rely on, while it is a great tool, using that authenticator app, um, using a third party control that you can actually integrate in. Um, we have those capabilities. It's a very rich and robust set of things that we have within our conditional access tree to say, hey, we can integrate with all of these components. And if we look at it in, in a more modern approach, what happens when we move to passwordless, right? If, if 81% of what we're seeing from a breaches or, or a compromise or coming from leaked credentials or sto stolen credentials. What happens when we talk about removing the credentials from that environment? Um, or we take it in a different direction, right? And we actually look at it from a compliance side. And this has actually become really, really powerful, not only from the evolution of saying, I need to restrict access, my four walls are gone. Um, I'm an academic medical center. I'm a higher ed institution that's conducting research. Um, and I just did the one thing that, that I never thought I'd have to do. And I sent everybody outside of my, my castle or outside of those walls and asked them to come back into my environment to access resources, to access, you know, secure information, whether that's PHI, PII, research information, um, financial data, we can go through the list of all these information types and these classifications. And what we've seen is a rapid adoption and transformation of policies around if the device isn't compliant or if the device itself is at risk, it's become compromised. I'm going to restrict access. Um, we can do this with guest accounts too. We can actually say, if you're a guest account, you're allowed to be invited into this institution. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to require you to have a strong set of credentials, as well as I'm not going to allow you to exfiltrate any data. And those are components within the tree and, and within the organization that have a ton of power to go in and control and restrict access to an organization, an institution. And when we look at policies like device compliance, I can add another level of security to that and I can make it an and statement and I can make it an or statement, meaning for the users that are within our institution, those 90%, those 95% of people within my organization, both staff, faculty and students, when they're doing the right things, they're accessing things in the right way, they're on the right device, we can allow them to go in and not be constricting, constraining, or overburdening that end user with multiple sign-in prompts from a seamless single sign-on capability, from multiple multi-factor authentications with things like Windows Hello for Business, or simply start looking at that device as something that's managed or trusted by the environment. If we take and add in the security components, like our Microsoft Defender ATP, we can actually tell your environment and tell the conditional access framework that, hey, this device now has crypto locker on it. It's no longer compliant. And that will update the system and integrate with the system in under two minutes to tell you that, hey, you do not have a compliant device that is actually able to access and, and able to exfiltrate data or even in some manners, and we see this more and more, block them from uploading content. So if we change the compliant framework, both from a, a granting access to saying this is now malicious or this has a virus on it, this is a compromised asset, it's no longer com compliant. Now I'm going to block you from actually uploading malicious information, malicious code, making changes to our Active Directory environment from an administrative standpoint. We can really start to lock those things down. But the goal of this isn't to do that for every single user. It's, it's really to do it in a situation where they are stepping outside of those boundaries. And I think of really common use cases from an academic health standpoint or an academic medical center rather that 
something as simple as a device not being encrypted on the hard drive, making that non-compliant and restricting that information from being put onto a non-compliant device is extremely powerful. And we've seen rapid adoption of that and, and rapid adoption of the unmanaged devices not being able to be synchronized or pull data from OneDrive or restricting and limiting access to teams into just a web browser. And we're gonna make sure that when we put that in the web browser, they're not able to download anything. Um, but before they even got to that point on that unknown device and, and an untrusted location, um, I've given them a multi-factor prompt. And, and when we see that control and that landscape shift, we're not blocking people from being collaborative. We're not blocking people from being able to work in their environment, on their devices, you're actually able to allow them to continue to contribute and collaborate within a secure framework where they can still do their job, they can still work, and if they are a bad actor or they're doing something malicious, they can't exfiltrate things, they can't upload things. We can control that and, and limit the landscape, and, and it really comes down to mitigating the risk. And those policy options that we talk to and the the device compliant framework is one of the few things out there today where you can add in a significant addition to your security posture on some things that you already have and don't require a significant uplift to implement if we're not talking about switching over or or we haven't looked at a rich coexistence in between sccm and intune it's time that we start doing that but first we should really be looking at are those devices something that are joined to our local Active Directory or are they already joined to Azure Active Directory? That hybrid configuration flag of something that is already joined to your environment can send a ton of information and we can actually allow the collaboration to continue on devices and on components that you own. And so we look at things like pins, we look at things like passwords that are required um, we look at things like I said before of, is this device sitting in a state that we don't know or we don't trust? Um, have I had a device that's now jailbroken and is trying to access resources? Am I not using the Microsoft suite of apps or the Teams clients on an iOS or an Android device? Um, am I going to restrict the control and the flow of information into that? There are a number of different things that we can do and we can look at. And when we look at that all up, there are a number of additional things that we can talk about. There are a number of different tools that we can talk about that all continue to support and reinforce the framework and the environment that we have today. I would say that if we look at securing access to your institution, there are a number of things that we can get started with. First of all, we have a, a Microsoft security workshops that are going on now with Microsoft cybersecurity experts, cybersecurity partners from all over the world um, that you can register for. They'll do a security and a threat check and assessment of your Office 365 environment. They'll do a security discovery using those Microsoft tools like we talked about and, and show you what they can do for you. Just like I said within the Zero Trust framework, is we're not here to just rip everything up and replace what you've done and what you've implemented from a security standpoint. But what we're trying to really do is give you threat intelligence and, and give you the ability to detect what's occurring in your environment today and how we can model and shape your security posture to move forward into the next realm with the modern security tools that Microsoft has. And whether we're looking at that across email, in, in on-prem, in the cloud, in other mail platforms, um, we look at the, the identity posture and framework, which I think we all need to start working on. And if you haven't started working on, certainly go into to that investigation on what does it take to have a modern identity infrastructure? If I have all of my applications in the cloud, why am I still authenticating against an on-prem environment? Um, does that make sense? Is that redundant from a site standpoint or can I increase my security posture by having those cloud authentications and even those on-prem apps that we used to serve up over a VPN, we can, we can put them into the cloud and protect them 
with security tools and, and components like Azure Active Directory. And, and that gives you the confidence to move forward in a cloud first methodology, it gives you the confidence to, to modernize, but getting the visibility and clarity into what's going on in your environment um, and, and see how you can shape and you can increase your security posture in the long term is really kind of the goal that we have here. We look at a bunch of different things within these, these frameworks. There's a few different types of the security workshops. Uh, some of the most popular components include not only looking at the Office 365 environment, but taking that Office 365 data and spinning that into a cloud first seam and soar like Azure Sentinel to see what we can actually view to to gain operational insights and, and pull those signals together, as well as taking a, a more active approach from a security and a, and, a, and a SOC standpoint of using components like the new Microsoft Threat Protection that, that went into public preview in the beginning of June, going in and actually giving you the capability to see not only what's happening with your endpoints, but combine that with the signals and the information that we're getting from your mailboxes and overlay that from not only just your cloud authentications, but what's occurring on-prem. Look at the way that files are being manipula manipulated. Look at the way that, that we have a bunch of information moving throughout a number of different platforms, a number of different products, and give you a, an attack framework um, that is industry best practices, that is falling into a, an open source methodology like the MITRE ATT&CK framework with, that we leverage within the Microsoft Threat Protection Platform. I will add in that we do also have for education um, a specific upcoming webinar series that's at the end of this month. We we're doing it as a three part. The first part is implementing uh, zero trust. The second part is actually the integration and leveraging Microsoft Threat Protection. And then as we wrap up that three-parter, we're gonna take all of those signals, we're gonna take all of that information that we have that's coming out of Microsoft Threat Protection, that's coming out of our information protection and data loss prevention, that's coming out of the Azure Active Directory side and put that into Azure Sentinel and combine that with on-prem telemetry to get true use cases around impossible travel um, situations like, you know, we see somebody signing in from three states away, but yes, they just use their badge access into building 11, and now they're actually going to and badging into the to the data center. Which one is the false positive, right? Or which one is the false negative? Where, where are we seeing um, a, a correct correlation or where are we seeing that threat evolve from? With that, I would like to say, you know, register for that series. Um, it is a, it's one that's done by myself and, and a, another uh, cloud solution architect, Man, uh, Manuel. And uh, it's at uh, aka.ms forward slash security in edu. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd like to th thank you for your time today. So this is really where I wanted to switch across to our manage apps within Teams topic. Now, as you saw as part of the opening keynote from the last two days, apps are a core part of Microsoft Teams. And that's both first party apps from Microsoft and then also third party apps. And this is really what gives you then the rich integration into over 500 apps. And here's just a subset that you can see around the screen. But one of the key parts is that you'll see this is how you now have the ability to bring in your workflows with colleagues and how we see educators bringing rich educational experiences to their students. And so really apps are a core part of Teams and this is really how you get the best experience from Microsoft Teams. So what am I gonna be covering as part of the session today? So this is really for IT administrators who have a, a couple of the common questions that we are seeing which is, for example, how do we go about as a global admin about managing apps for your organization? How do I check the usage of apps within my tenant? And how do I ensure that apps that are relevant for specific groups of users are discoverable by those users? So this is really where I get a question asked a lot about, okay, well, Dominic, if I look at the app store, I mean, there's hundreds of apps in there and they are 
they look like I'll, they will add a lot of value to me, but which ones are being used and how they're being used? And that's why I just wanted to share a quick example. So of course, when we click on apps within Teams, we go to the app store, and this is where we then see these integrations. As mentioned, you know, you'll see hundreds of apps from well-known third-party developers, from brand new app developers, but all of them are reviewed by Microsoft to ensure code integrity and security at the guidelines that we require before they can make it into the App Store itself. And then at that point, this is where we then have these hundreds of integrations from Trello, MindMeister, Mural, Adobe, and many, many more. Now, in that regard, then, the question is, well, how are they being used? And so I just want to share a few examples. And you'll notice already in the featured section of our live Q&A, I shared the view, which is to how UEL were approaching their automation. And that is flipgrid.com forward slash teams edu. That's the teams scenario library. And the teams scenario library gives you then real examples from institutions on how they're using Microsoft Teams. And I just want to share a few of the app examples that you'll find within those videos. Those are scenario focused videos that talk about how Teams is being applied. And this is then just a few quick screenshots from within those scenarios. So we saw University of East London earlier today. They were taking, for example, a very streamlined and very powerful approach of using the website tab to embed a view of their VLE or learning management system directly into Microsoft Teams. We've seen, for example, South Gloucestershire and Strad College, how they're using then Kahoot and other apps within Microsoft Teams to support things like quiz quizzes and interactive learning. If you have a look then, for example, at Newcastle University, they, there is a great example by Jill Holden on how she's using Polly to do polls with her students and get real-time feedback. And there's a wonderful example from actually a school who I think have given a wonderful example of then not just using the apps from the App Store, but even creating their own custom app at Ac Academia Naval which is actually a custom bot that is then created to answer student questions as part of a frequently asked questions bot. So it's not then just apps that are being used within courses, within research projects. There are also, of course, many integrations available for IT services to help you as part of your day-to-day -day workflow and to also streamline services that you provide to your users. And so this is where we see a lot of popular examples such as ServiceNow, Zendesk, Freshdesk, Asana, Jira, and many, many more, where you can then really bring in your IT workflows directly into Microsoft Teams to automate and save you time and to make it easier for your users to engage with your services. And I want to share an example of that with the integration between ServiceNow and Microsoft Teams in a really quick two-minute overview. ServiceNow and Microsoft have teamed up to simplify work for everyone by making self-service solutions easily accessible and convenient. How? ServiceNow's virtual agent integration with Microsoft Teams allows users to help themselves. By providing an automated and frictionless experience, users can get the answers they need quickly, all within the Microsoft Teams app. Users participate in an engaging self-service experience with natural language understanding. They can help themselves to open an IT ticket, check on its status, or update it, search a knowledge base for answers, order work-from-home equipment, and attempt to resolve issues such as VPN or printer problems. Let's follow an employee's experience as they try to resolve an issue from within Microsoft Teams using ServiceNow's virtual agent. Chatting with a virtual agent is like chatting with a coworker. Open chat and then choose virtual agent. This employee is having trouble with VPN, so he will type his question in the now virtual agent chat window. Since this is a common problem, ServiceNow virtual agent already has a topic built for it with basic troubleshooting questions. The employee will answer the pre-built prompts and questions in order to try to solve the problem. If the troubleshooting doesn't work, the employee alerts the virtual agent, who then offers up knowledge-based articles to access to see if they can solve their issue. Knowledge-based search is available for any issue a user is facing and will provide additional options to try before transferring to a live agent. Since the articles provided still haven't solved the employee's problems, 
ServiceNow Virtual Agent offers to open a help desk ticket for him to record the incident. The VPN access issue is time sensitive, so the employee can ask the virtual agent to escalate the ticket. Once the system finds the ticket, the employee can click Escalate and provide justification for the request. The virtual agent then confirms the escalation and level. The employee can now view the comments added into the ServiceNow system. ServiceNow Virtual Agent and Microsoft Teams gives you the support you need, when you need it, from anywhere. And it's easy. You can automatically link your ServiceNow user account to Microsoft Teams. Learn how today. We're simplifying work for everyone and helping you make your world of work work better. So that's a great example of just one of the many IT apps that you have available to integrate into Microsoft Teams. And you could see how that streamlines the experience for users and also reduces the workload on help desks. So if we talk about then apps, for those, I've been using a little bit of terminology, which I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. There's really three key types of apps when we talk about Microsoft Teams. There are the first party apps, those made by Microsoft. So think of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and those are then the apps that are made. But if you are only using the first party apps, you are only getting access to a tiny fraction of the integrations that are available and the workflows that can be done within Microsoft Teams. And that's because of that open ecosystem that I mentioned. We have then a review process to ensure code integrity of the apps that are submitted to Microsoft Teams. But this is where we then have third party developers like ServiceNow who then provide app integrations which then allow you to have an enabled a central location for your users, for example, to then do things like opening an IT help desk support ticket, doing things like managing tasks in Trello and hundreds of other workflows that then can be enabled through the third party apps within Teams. And the last part is, and I'll talk more about this after the tea break, you have the ability to also do custom apps. And so custom apps allow you to be able to go through and then from there, enable then experiences that you can then create unique line of business experiences or things that, for example, add additional value to help your students with learning. And we've seen these examples from University of New South Wales with Qbot. And you saw an example just before with Caesar at the school where they were then using Caesarbot to be able to go through and answer student questions. So this is really then when we think about then apps within Teams, we have first party, third party, and then even custom apps that you can make as part of that open and extensible Teams platform. Now, when we create an app within Teams, you'll see and experience different types of interactions. And that's because just like your smartphone, think of Microsoft Teams as a platform that provides app capabilities. Just like a phone, for example, the let's say you have a smartphone that has a GPS, it has a camera, and it has then different capabilities that the app can take advantage of. Same for Microsoft Teams. With ServiceNow, you saw an example of how they had a chatbot to help then users be able to go through and manage and request IT support. This is where we can then have interactions where you saw for UEL, how they were then taking a tab, which is an embedded experience, and they had, for example, their VLE embedded as a tab within Microsoft Teams. Or you can see an example then of a project team working together through a series of tasks. When we send messages, you'll notice when you click on that three dot ellipsis, this is where we can then also bring in message extensions. So if you have the YouTube app, for example, this is where we can then search for a YouTube video directly within the compose message space in Teams, making it easy to be able to, for example, share a video with students. Or for example, if you're using, let's say Jira, you can then search for an open work item and again, be able to reference that easily within the message space within Teams. We also then have the ability for apps to be able to do things like going through and then doing activity feed notifications. So for example, giving an update on a support ticket or an update if a task has been completed. 
And you'll notice then in the conversation space, we can also have what we call adaptive cards. And these give you the ability to have those rich interactions. Remember when we saw with ServiceNow, the user could click easily. Do you have a Mac? Do you have a PC? And then just like that, they can interact seamlessly as part of that message space. And that's where we then also have a view, not just for using apps with others, but a personal view. So for example, I can view just the tasks that are assigned to me within the planner app. And that gives me a personal view, just of my view of then across all of my teams of what I am needing to focus on for my day or week ahead. So when we think about apps within Microsoft Teams, we then have the store, which I was sharing just a moment ago, where we have the hundreds of third party app integrations. And you also then have the ability to deploy internal custom apps. And these do not then go to the public Microsoft Store. These go then to your internal app store. So for anyone that's used, for example, the Windows Business Store previously, this is the same concept here within Teams, where again, my users still have a seamless experience where they can come into the app store in Teams and then see both the third party public apps as well as also custom apps that you have built and created for your staff and for your students. When it comes to then managing apps, we also, of course, have rich capabilities within the admin portal, which I'll talk a little bit more about today, giving you then granular per level, per user level app permission controls. And we have the ability then to make it easy to find apps where you can then pre-pin them on the left hand side, making it easy, for example, for project teams who might be all actively using, say, Planner to easily see Planner. Or, for example, you might have a student portal that you would have then pinned on the left hand side, again, making it easy and seamless for students to interact with. So a few common questions when it comes to apps. What is the best approach to managing apps? And that is to allow third party apps and then review the policy based on usage. So this is really what we mean by you've got the ability to then visualize and then monitor who is using the apps in your institution. But one of the big things that I've seen a few institutions go wrong is they block all of the apps and then expect their IT department to know better than their end users on which apps will help them in their workflow. And then they'll go through and say, well, we don't have time to review all of the apps. It's important to empower your users to be able to find apps that add value to their workflow. And then also over time, monitor those apps which are being used and make sure they meet your guidelines and your data governance requirements. And I'll show you how we can do that in just a few moments. And so this is where really it's about empowering users to be able to explore, integrate their services for teaching, learning and working. And this is where we then also have the ability to make sure that we can then manage that over time for any apps that we do not align to our institution. So how do I know what the app does? Well, every single app, just like if you go to the app store on your phone, it has a description of what the app will do. All of the app developers will then have a link to their privacy policy and all of the apps will then also as part of the app developer, they will then have websites that go in depth on how to use the app, how-to guides. You should never ever be creating your own how-to guides for something like the Adobe Creative Cloud or Trello. You know, these are great examples of apps that of course already have extensive support documentation for you to be able to go through. And so at its core, Microsoft Teams requires third-party apps for the best and most integrated experience for you and for your users. Now, absolutely, app security and reviewing compliance is an important part of having apps within Teams. And this is where we have gone and worked really hard with governance teams at universities and within enterprise to make sure that there is clear information for you to make informed decisions on. And so this is where you have the ability as part of docs.microsoft.com to review the app certification for the apps that are available within the Teams App Store. So let me take you through a quick example of what this looks like and then how we can bring, bring this together. So you'll see here we have then the app security review for Polly. Polly, as you saw, a very popular app, an app as an example being used within many universities, colleges and schools. And so what I can then do is you'll notice when I head over into the browser, we have again public facing information 
which is available to you to then easily be able to then go through and see the apps and the way that they use data. So remember, if I go through and I look at something like, let's take Polly as the example. If I look at Polly in the App Store, again, a very popular polling app. Polly is here. It gives me as an end user a clear overview of what the app can do, how I can use it. A great example. Educators love using it to get feedback from their students. I can see here permissions. And then, of course, if I go across, this is where by using Polly, this is where I can also look at the privacy policy. And so this gives me clear information on Polly and the details about the service itself. This is where I can then also go through. And you'll notice from within the admin portal, I can then see here as well, if I go over to Microsoft Teams apps, manage apps, this is where I get a view of all of the apps and their current status within my organization. You'll notice that as I can scroll through, I can see, for example, the current version. I can see the publisher and I'll just search for Polly just to quickly bring it to the top. And so that's a great example where I can then also go through and then I can click on, for example, details as part of the certification that apps like Polly provide. And so this is where I can see in detail security information, compliance information, and additional details. I can see data handling information, and this is all available here for, to help me make a review and an informed choice. And this is why we see apps being used so successfully to be able to go through and be used and deployed. Now you might be saying to me, well, what about GDPR compliance? And of course, this is where, for example, let's just take a different one. If we use something, let's say uh, Adobe Sign. Again, this is where Adobe then have clear information. And of course, if we were to search for Adobe Sign GDPR compliance, that's where we can then easily find the details of what they have available because these app developers then provide these details, just like you can see as part of Polly, as part of their privacy statements on their website available for you to be able to go through and review. So this is really making it a single place for me to be able to go through and make an informed decision of the apps within my environment. One of the biggest things here, though, is also making sure that we have effective workflows that are supportive of our students to learn job ready skills and our academics to be able to work and collaborate effectively together. So if we go back to it, this is really where we need to see teams. Those third party apps create the best experience for your users, and this is how we can go through and then review details of the apps themselves. OK, so. Now, when it comes to ways to be able to manage apps, this is where we have then you have options to enable and manage the apps and then also to be able to promote those apps to your end users. And so this is where we're going to be able to go through and see that we have both the ability to then do app permissions. So this is where we have things like setup policies and permissions policy. And that'll also then be able to then change the team's UI to be able to then both make the team's app available. And you'll notice on the right hand side, even do things like pin it, making it easy for our users to be able to access things like Smartsheets, Trello, Mural, and whatever apps that you pin. So this is where as we start to go through, of course, it's also part of then checking, well, how are the apps being used and is the investment that we're making into these apps? For example, you know, we might have licenses with Trello. We want to make sure that people are actually using it. So this is where a common question is, for example, it is important for me to be able to empower my users to be able to find apps that help them teach, research, learn, and work together. And there is no chance that I'll be able to go through and review every app on my own to be able to know every lecturer what works best for them, because only that educator, only that student will be able to find the best apps that supports their learning and working. But this is where, of course, I like the idea of my users being able to find apps that add value to their work and learning but how do I know what is being used? And so this is where we then have the app usage reports within Microsoft Teams. So a quick example of that is a screenshot on the right hand side, and I'll show you where to find that in just a minute. But this is where I can then see the amount of active users that an app has. But this is where we then get to the next question, which is how do I see what each user is signing into? And so yes, of course, you can go through 
And as Ian was sharing just before, this is where Microsoft have extensive security tools available for you. So this is where we have Azure Active Directory. And Azure Active Directory, of course, if you do any sign in with your identity as part of Azure ID, this is where you as administrators can go through and see that example with Ken Meyer. With, you know, we can see that he's using MindMeister and Kahoot. This is where, of course, that we have the ability, if we find an app that's inappropriate, we can then block students or staff members being able to use their corporate identity to be able to sign in. But let's think of the opposite scenario where if you block all of the apps, what options do you give to your users? Well, then that's where they will then create shadow IT, they will not use tools that you have, and they will reduce your ability to gain actionable and meaningful insights. Because if they're not using the identities that you provide, if they're not feeling empowered to use the tools that you provide, they will take your corporate content, your educational research, and they'll put that into a platform that suits them if your current tools are too restricted for them to be able to work and learn effectively. And so this is where it's not then just you needing to, we're not expecting you to manually review, for example, every user in your Azure Active Directory. That's where you saw Ian talking about the capabilities with services like cloud app security, where can I automate protection of my users while still allowing them to find apps which help? And then yes, this is where cloud app security will proactively and continuously monitor the usage of identities, the interactions between accounts. And this is where it will then also proactively notify you of any suspicious behavior. And so this is where we start to see this security profile coming together well beyond the physical bounds of our institution. And this is how I can then effectively have my students and staff being able to integrate and use apps, how I can then review the apps themselves, and I can also then monitor which apps are being used at the per user level when it comes to their identity. So let me do a quick example of where do we go through and get the app usage reports within Microsoft Teams. So if I go through and I head over back over to my web browser, this is where you will notice, for example, within Teams, of course, as a user, I can interact with apps, but yourselves as administrators, you have the admin portal, of course, being admin.teams.microsoft.com. So this is where within the admin portal, the quite appropriately named Analytics and reports are where we can get reports on app usage in our tenancy. And I'd actually already run it, but let me just do it again for everyone so you can see it. So this is where you'll notice we have reports that allow us to see app usage. We can see details around our telephony. We can see details on our team's devices, live events. And you'll remember back to University of East London where they shared how users are interacting, the number of conversations, the number of online meetings. This is where we can also see things like user activity within Teams. I've clicked on apps usage and then I've clicked my data range as the last month. And so this is where I can now actually see the apps that are being used within my environment. Now, this is my example environment. So it's a real tenant, but it is example users. So this is where it's a, your environment should have significantly number of users rather than just a handful. But this is where I can then go through and I can see the users. I can see the amount of interactions that we're having. So we've had six people use, for example, Freehand by Envision in the last 30 days, a really great whiteboarding app. And what this means is then I can go through Azure Active Directory and I can then see in detail the identities that are being used to sign into these apps and into these services. So this is really giving me then clear insight and also actionable automatic monitoring while empowering my users to have these rich learning and working experiences, which particularly our students are expecting to have an excellent online collaborative experience, just like they would have an excellent in-person collaborative experience in one of your campus facilities. So when it comes to then the Teams policy model, how does that work? Well, policies are then applied by yourselves as administrators, and you have your de default policy, and then you have granular control. And so the way that this works is we have then the ability to have per user policy which means we can then create a custom set of policies for one group of users compared to another. And this is a really great one. For example, let's take the app pin policy. It means that for example, internal project teams, I can then have an app policy that is custom to the project teams where they might have say Jira, Asana, Planner as a pre-pinned app on the left-hand side. 
but of course maybe your students don't necessarily use JIRA as part of their project planning. And so this is where we then have one policy set up for one group of users compared to another within my organization. And of course, by default, your default policy will cover everyone until you create the custom policies themselves. So let's jump through and I'll show you some examples of creating then an app setup policy. So this is here within Teams. If we go over to permission policies, you'll notice when I, I can go through and then I can check the org wide policies that we have. And again, this is where I have the ability to have tenant wide settings. I can go through, I can change the global. So those are the default settings. So unless you create additional policy packages, these are then going to be applied to all users. And this is where I can go through and then do things like creating a new custom app policy to manage which apps are available. Let's take the app example here, where for example, my institution is invested in using Microsoft Planner. So I have the option where I can then go through, allow all apps, or if I need to just make sure my users are empowered to use apps, but there might be one or two that I do need to block. Let's say I can then block a specific app. That's where I can go through. I search for the app from the App Store list, and I can then say in this example, take Trello. And while I'm powering my users to use all of the other apps, Trello right now institutionally, we've decided that we're using a different task management and planning tool. Then I can go through and add that and assign that to, I should say that by default will be updated to all of my users. Alternatively, if I click on add, I can create a new policy. And this is where I can go through and then create, for example, here, these are a group of workers, allow apps, make those apps available to just a subset of my users that are using then the Microsoft apps. And then I can still go ahead and then block other third party apps while still allowing my tenant apps. So once I go through and then just like that, I've got the ability for those to become either enabled or disabled. And you'll notice here as we go ahead, if a user tries to then take an action or interact with one of those apps that has been blocked, for example, here, Adobe Sign, they will receive a message from the administrator for that. So a very nice and easy one on how you can then go through and then use Teams app policy. We also have the ability to pin apps. And so what this is, is a great one where you've got the ability to then show apps in context of the Teams UI. And we went into depth on this yesterday, so I'll just do a really quick refresher. Setup policy allows you the ability here to then create a list of apps that will be pinned for your, your users on the right-hand side, both on mobile and also then on the desktop app. On mobile, you'll need to enable the preview and on desktop, this is available right now. And we went into that in depth yesterday, so make sure you go back to the recording if you didn't join for day one. Okay, so this is where we have now. You might have seen, well, of course, when we say per user policy assignment, this is where absolutely we then have say PowerShell to allow you to be able to then manage policies for a large number of your users. And so this is where any Teams policy whether it's app setup, meeting, chat policies, you can then apply those across your users at scale within your organization. So that's a quick overview then of Microsoft Teams apps. And again, all of this information and more is available as part of our public docs. You have the slides available to you from today's event. And so this is where I have a few resources and next steps. And this is where next steps are we have admin training, and then we have resources like you saw today from the app setup policy, the app certifications that you can then go through and then make informed, confident decisions with. All right, folks, hope you had a good break. Um, so in this session, we'll be building upon what we previously discussed in terms of apps and managing apps within, within Microsoft Teams. App templates are low or no code templates to address common scenarios, workflows, or experiences within Microsoft Teams. These pieces of code were developed by Microsoft. They are production ready and they were published and they're published open source available on GitHub for you to download, customize, and deploy within your own Azure and O365 environments. We built these templates based on customer feedback and what we are hearing, which would benefit multiple customers. 
There's also a way to start with a piece of code and customize it to your needs instead of starting from scratch, which is the upper quadrant of the graph you see on the screen here. Because these templates are deployed in your Azure and O365 instance, this adds additional confidence and security with deploying these templates. We have over 30 app templates currently available with more in the pipeline, but the most common one I see, and actually I'll spend the next couple slides talking about what are our, our most common ones, is one called FAQ Plus. FAQ Plus is a Q&A bot that brings a human into the loop when it is unable to help. A user can ask the bot a question, and if the bot responds with an answer that it contains in its knowledge base. If not, the bot allows the user to submit a query, which then gets posted to a pre-configured team of experts who can help and provide support by providing them notification, saying so-and-so needs help, go reach out to them. Um, so it really completes the loop of a gap that most bots have is a one-way type of communication or, or a closed loop communication. This allows you to bring in a live person to continue to help in this case. Uh, both are great for staff and students for commonly asked questions. Uh, within a course or or across multiple uh, departments. Let's look at a real life example of how this is being used at the University of Texas. So they deployed FAQ Plus to address a problem with providing the right information when students need it with how, without having to look around. It is deployed for the Tech Cafe and they named it Bautista, a play on the words for the cafe theme of barista. Uh, they downloaded the code, they branded it, and they added their own Q&A pairs to their deployment. Students ask the bot a question, the bot checks its Q&A pairs and replies to the student if it knows the answer. It also provides the option to escalate to a tech expert if the bot doesn't have the answer or, it was, or the answer provided wasn't exactly the answer the student was looking for. Uh, using the the data from FAQ Plus, the team over at the University of Texas can look at the Azure Analytics and, and, and direct specific trainings based on hot topics that they're that they're seeing or top questions being asked. Uh, and this has especially been useful for them as they're shifting from uh, an on on-prem or on-campus environment to working remote and, and learning remote. They're able to keep feeding it different Q&A pairs and it's adapting to the needs of their of their audience. An additional variance of FAQ Plus is, is the QBot, um, developed by a partner in Australia and made famous by Dr. Kellerman. This is probably our most uh, I would say famous or, or people get the most excited when they see this, this cube, at least, at least academics. Uh, Dr. Kellerman uses Qbot for his foundation level engineering course of 500 students to ensure no student question goes unanswered. Um, Dr. Kellerman really has a premise of how do we take my foundation level course of 500 with 500 uh, individual islands of learning and make them a single learning community. And how he does it is he's deployed the QBot within his team. And when a student asks QBot a question, it automatically tags the teacher's, the story, the, the student's teaching assistant. Uh, as questions get answered, QBot builds on the Q&A pair and eventually answering the question for the students automatically. Now, because the questions are in teams, students can go see what the replies are, uh, and because the TA gets tagged, um, it's not just a, hey, I'm going to email my TA for the question, and then you have multiple students emailing the TA for the same question. You're providing a forum here, which everybody can see it. Uh, you're making sure that the questions get answered by tagging the TA. Uh, the, the experience that's a very high level, really what happens is the TA gets almost like a ticket that says, hey, you, there's a question for you, please please answer it. Uh, TA answers it and closes out the ticket and make sure the, the process is complete. Icebreaker is another one of my favorite uh, app templates uh, and is actually getting a lot of attention uh, in these past few months. One of the biggest disadvantages of remote or hybrid learning 
are those chance encounters to meet new people uh, and and network? Serendipity is one of my customers. Well, one of my customers calls it right. Like we we can't come back to campus, but we need serendipity to occur. How it works is you take a team, and based on the membership, it will provide random pairings suggesting they meet and connect. Think of this: uh, if you had uh, a team of all students or if you had a team for uh, a freshman class or uh, all the all the students for uh, the business school as an example this bot will provide a bit of a, a little bit of that serendipity right it, it introduces two people it offers to say if they'd like to chat within that that prompt it allows you to create a teams meeting in which they can connect learn a little bit more about each other network opportunities build their network that you know most folks are going to be missing out on when they don't return to campus now privacy is also important so users can opt out of this service even though they're part of the team and they can opt back in based on their uh, their, their, their preferences Rounding off the top three app templates is Company Communicator. Company Communicator allows you to manage broadcast communications via Teams. Think of the scenario if there's a broken water pipe in a building and you need to notify all students and staff that the building will be closed or a weather system forces you to close campus. Company Communicator allows you to compile a rich message target your audience and send that message out to the users that the user will receive as a chat on their team's client, including the mobile device if they have it. As part of the options, what you have for company communicator is you can disable reply. So it actually can be a true way, a truly one way notification push to say, hey student, McIntyre building has a water pipe closure. We'll be canceling all closes, uh, classes for the rest of the day. And you can, you know, you can, because this is open source, you can connect it to your sys and you can connect it to other systems of records there to know exactly who are the people or the groups of people you need to target to be proactive uh, in there. Um, I really like this because if you, if they do have the mobile device installed, they don't need to be around their machine. They'll get the prompt and saying, oh, okay, this is, this is the current situation. We thrive when we're working and learning in environments that support our emotional well-being. Right? These environments in which we feel heard, valued, safe and included. The challenge educators are going to be facing with online or hybrid learning is understanding the well-being of students. We recently released a new app template called Reflect App Template, which is a new social and emotional learning app. It allows educators to capture students' feelings in an easy way to capture the pulse. I've got a short video on this, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back uh, in a few, a few moments. I'll be showing how to use the new Reflect app, which is free in Microsoft Teams. Reflect is really designed for social emotional learning and how can you gauge the temperature of the feelings in your classroom. Now Reflect needs to be installed by the IT admin first, and at the end of this video, there's a link on how IT admins can upload new apps. But in this case, I'm gonna go down to the lower left and click apps. And I've already had Reflect installed by my IT admin, and I'm gonna click this. I'll say add, I'm gonna choose add to a team. And now I'm gonna search my team and I'll find uh, civics, and I'll say set up a bot, and that's the Reflect bot. Now Reflect is installed and you can see it prompts me right away, but right here is this called a message extension. And if I click this, it opens up the dialogue for Reflect. So first off, it can ask a question. I can ask my class, how are you feeling? How did the week go? How did you feel about today's project? I could also add my own thing. So I could say, how are things going? I can customize these, but I'll just choose how are you feeling as the default. Now the next part, privacy is very important. We want to keep things private or not when we're asking people about how they're feeling. So I can set it for public where anyone can see what anyone else reflected. I can choose anonymous where the names are not displayed at all to anyone, including the teacher, or creator only, meaning in this case, the educator created it and they're the only ones who can see the reflections of the students' names. The dates are next, so I can choose a date. I can make it for today or for Monday. I can also set a time and I can also set a recurrence and schedule that in the future. 
So if I wanted to keep this simple and I just said send right now, I'm just going to hit confirm here. And you can see it put out a reflection. How are you feeling? This goes to the class. And now I'm going to show what it looks like for the student to actually sign in and make a reflection. Now I'm signed in as the student Alex and it's asking me in the channel, how are you feeling? So maybe Alex is having a great day. I'll click this. So this shows my response and it says it's created by the teacher, Kara Coleman, and only Kara can see the names. And if I want to change my response, I can do that too or remove it. So Alex is feeling great. Now I'll sign in as a different student and we'll see how that looks like. So now I'm signed in as Ella and she is in the same channel and sees the reflection and she can see, oh, someone else has responded. Now maybe Ella's not feeling as good. She chooses the slightly sad, but you can see she can't see who responded. So there's no names. The only people who can see names is the teacher. And so to reiterate, that is extra important with reflect and you might choose completely anonymous so the teacher can't see the names or you want to make it public but you have those privacy settings. So let's switch back to the teacher, Kara, and see what she sees. So now I'm signed in as Kara, the teacher, and I'm gonna say view reflections. So the teacher sees that Alex had this response and Ella had this response. And what's really nice is this is a way for the teacher to really check that pulse quickly. Another nice thing you can do is schedule when the reflections go out. So I'm gonna launch reflect from the bottom here. Maybe I'll make a custom one, which is class, check in and I want this to go every weekday so I'm going to go here and choose Monday and I'm going to set it to go at 8 a.m. and I want it to repeat every weekday so it's the class check-in at 8 a.m. and I'm going to click confirm now how this shows up if I go back into reflect again I want to show the little scheduling down here you're going to see scheduled reflections and I click this and it shows my little daily recurrence pattern here. And what's nice is I can change the recurrence right here. I can make it every day, every week. And it's really nice to be able to schedule these things right in the Reflect app. So that's a quick tour of Reflect. That's our new social and emotional learning app. It's free. IT admins need to install this from Git and the instructions on how to do that are at the link right below in this video. So what I really like uh, about that is I like the privacy aspect where just the educator who posts the reflect can say only I can see the response, but this also then gives the educator the ability to see who do I need to reach out to to make sure uh, it's OK. Um, there's a number of studies saying that you know the, the, the current situation we're in is going to have the health challenges with with students. Uh, this just gives them the ability to, to do to be honest, to do a check in and then the educator can go reach out to say, hey, are things OK? Do you want to talk about it? Do we need to uh, bring in some additional help? Right? So I really like that it is it is a new one that got released. Uh, I saw it this morning and I said I need to include this as part of the presentations. I really feel passionate about this particular space. All right, so there are uh, over 30 app templates that we have uh, that are currently available. This is just a small list and the URL there will take you to the, the complete list, but don't worry about looking at this right now. Part of our exercise that we're going to be doing is reviewing the app templates uh, together. Before we do that, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more about some of the solutions that I'm working with customers on in, in their environments, right? So the first one is a level zero support bot. This is very similar to what we saw in the, bar, the, the Bautista example of the University of Texas, where a student connects with the bot, asks it a question, the bot goes to the Q&A pair, sees if it has an answer, and provides the answer. If it is not able to provide the answer, it will say ask for help, and then uh, this this particular pot, spot here where it says SMEQ, because this is open source and customizable, you can do whatever you want to, to this. The default behavior for FAQ Plus is post in a Teams channel. My customers are actually connecting to ServiceNow and connecting to Remedy to automatically create a ticket on behalf of that individual user that asked the question, which then normal help desk processes kick in. I've also had a user say, I just, I have an established process already when a user emails me so that process will then kick off an email 
to uh, their, their normal email queue and then get escalated to a, an individual to then support the user. But that's just part of it. That's just part of the solution, right? So answering the questions and getting help is just part of these questions. How do we become more intelligent around the questions that are being asked and the gaps in the knowledge base that we have? So part of the solution is we're going to be using Azure Analytics and we're going to look at the questions that are being asked and we're going to see what are the top questions that we don't have an answer to. OK, now time to go revisit our Q&A pair and update the knowledge base to make sure that we're able to adequately answer those questions. And then the other questions, the other query that we can run part of the analytics is what are the top questions being asked this week or this month or in, in a certain duration? And then what you can do is you can combine app templates to create a solution. So in this case, we're taking it and saying, if there has been an increase in the question, how do I reset my password? We can use Company Communicator to push training resources to the audience around the elevated uh, or, or the, the increased queries for that particular workload, right? So really thinking about providing the questions and answers this the the individuals need when they need it being able to provide an escalation path reviewing the gaps in the knowledge base that are currently there so we can fill those gaps seeing what types of questions that are being asked and pushing training down to the users so they become more aware of it right and so they're using the system less um, you know this is what when I go to my customer, this is called the level zero support bot. You're providing support inside of Teams and you're providing intelligence on top of that. The next solution we're working on uh, is, is digitally transforming this uh, particular institution staff time management process. So it is a fairly manual process. They request for time off from their manager via email or whatever process that they, that they have or just walking by their desk. The manager says yes, then the individual needs to send a meeting invite to the group, letting them know that they're off and there's a couple different processes in place. So we're going to do a bot framework here where they, the, the, the user will say, hey, you know, I think it, I think the one one of my customers connects to to work day. I believe it is. Uh, you know, hey, hey, bot, how many days vacation do I have left? Bot will go out to work day, pull in. You know, you got 14 days of vacation left. Would you like to take some? Yes. Shows them a calendar through an adaptive card. They can select the start date, the end date, and when they hit uh, request. An approval flow kicks off, alerts the man manager inside of Teams. The manager can look at the, the approval, hit approve, and when the approval flow kicks in, the days are deducted from Workday, and then the automatic calendar invite uh, takes is sent out. Uh, this organization also has to do weekly time entry. Uh, so instead of going to a particular website every single week, a notification will be sent to them uh, every Friday at 2 p.m. saying, hey, just a reminder that you need to enter your time. In that notification, it will allow the users to say, copy my time from last week uh, or enter in a custom time, which will then connect to the web, the, the time management system and allow them to uh, sort of ease of use of, of, of making that that, uh, that time entry there. And then the third one is com combining uh, a lot of different things. Uh, it, it, the third one, uh, Devjohn is going to be talking a little bit about the template, so I won't get into that, but this is a student portal that uh, we're, we're working with a few institutions on, but we've done uh, app pinning, so we've deployed the app a custom app. We have pinned the app to the very top called the student template. And what this does is it uh, it's essentially a portal where it, it shows them their schedule. Um, it connects to their LMS. It brings in the information from their LMS. But on top of this is we're using app templates to unlock new experiences. So we're using things like icebreaker in here. We're using things like badging to really uh, show people how best to uh, keep their community or, or, or that, that sense of connectivity to their their hub uh, institution uh, there. So these are just some some examples that were our team was, was working on. There, there's, there's many more there. So when you think about apps, it's app template is a good place to start, but th there's a lot that you can do within teams uh, as as the platform. All right, it is activity time. 
Now we have uh, approximately uh, about six minutes left, so I'm actually going to do this with you. There's two links I'd like you to to look at. So the first one is aka.ms forward slash teams app templates. What this does is this takes you to the list of our current app template library. I will go through that with you. I want to be able to show point out some really cool ones that I really like on top of the ones that I shared with you. But also, all of the app templates that we've created are based on customer feedback, right? Are based on what our customers are, are seeing and hearing and being like, oh, this would be really cool. So aka.ms teams edu live dash it is a quick survey. Let us know what your thoughts are for which app templates we should invest in for future uh, future templates, right? So let's go ahead. I'm going to go and that link there. So aka.ms forward slash teams app template takes you templates. Sorry with an S takes you to this link here. So teams templates from Microsoft Teams. What you'll see is a you know the, what is an app template, the benefits of using app templates, and then you will see a list of the templates that we currently have, right? So associate insights, not going to cover this too. I'm not going to cover all of them, but you can see here some of them a combination of Power Apps, some of them are your SharePoint. But the ones I really like, especially for education, is is an attendance app. So this is a Power App that you can incorporate directly into your team uh, that will read your roster and allows the educator to to mark individual students late, uh, uh, late present, late or or not there, or excuse with a reason. Uh, and then they can look at the uh, the history of them, they can export it, they can email it to themselves. Uh, it's, it's, I actually really like this and, and a lot of folks find this to be uh, extremely useful. Underneath every app template, you're going to see a get in, get, get it on GitHub. So when we click on get it on GitHub, it takes us to the download uh, or the GitHub page and it gives us more information. So it gives us some documentation, so what it is, historical attendance this is for the for that particular uh, app template there's a deployment guide where we see how do we deploy it so step by step you can download it you can deploy it we have architecture so we're sharing the entire architecture of this this allows you as an IT professional to customize that experience. I have a customer actively working on deploying this while feeding this back to their canvas lms right so or your your lms as an attendance it's open source you can take it you can use it as a strong base and customize it you can brand it you can do things that other things that you want to do with it book a room i think is really cool um you know if you're if you're in the hub or the student center and students want to say hey what room is available for for a quick discussion they can quickly connect to your to your exchange calendar see what rooms are available and allows them to quickly book a room directly uh, inside of teams celebrations this is uh, i really like this one to build that sense of camaraderie so uh being able to list off individuals birthdays more so from the staff and administration side rather than the student side individuals birthdays or their anniversaries at the at the uh, at the institution uh, a big post saying hey it's max's birthday wish him a happy birthday um, allows you to do that company communicator that we've talked about um, group contact lookup crowdsourcer is an interesting one people are playing with this uh, they think about this as when you think of the portal that I talked about previously, adding a crowdsourcer in there. So when they ask questions like, hey, where is the best? Uh, where is the best place to get a pizza on campus? Or, hey, looking for a carpool going back home for the weekend. Uh, they can post it using crowdsourcer and then people can then post and reply. Custom stickers so you can bring your own mascot logo as a as a message extension and customize that here each prescription is a new one expert finder so if you're working with a large IT organization you're like who's the expert who who's the person that really does planner who's the person that really knows you know, the retail business right um, it leverages the attributes in, in Active Directory to find the right person for you uh, inside of teams FAQ plus we briefly talked about goal tracker uh, great ideas. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, group activities. This is an interesting one. It allows you to create 
uh, groups, either public or private, and uh, it creates channels and adds those users to those channels. Uh, so it creates small groups for you uh, rather than you having to manually do it uh, itself. So HR support, uh, icebreakers we discuss, uh, incentives, incident reporter, open badges is another cool one. Uh, it connects to, to Badger and it allows you to reward people on particular activities or badges that they've done. So this is super important if they're delivering in a remote or a hybrid model, how do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them connected to your institution? You can do things like Badger in there. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but as you can see, there's there's a lot of different ones here. I do request, I do suggest you take some time after today's sessions to look at all of these. Uh, and then the most important thing I think we I have for you right now, a big ask is let us know your thoughts, right? Like tell us what you think where we should be uh, spending our time investing the app template, aka.ms forward slash teams edu live dash IT. And we'll spend the next few minutes doing that while we queue up our next, here we go. What would app, app template was interesting the most? What was useful seeing uh, in there? And then has your institution ever deployed apps to Azure before? Three questions, super simple. Uh, and on that note, I am at time. So, Deep Johnny, uh, yours to take over. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Deep Johnny Mitra. I am a PM on the SharePoint team. Uh, and in the next few minutes, I'm, we're going to talk about how you can extend and enrich your team's experience with SharePoint. We are going to focus on two different ways you can do this. The first is using SharePoint site templates built for education scenarios to inform and engage students and staff at your organization. And the second is to use SharePoint spaces to build these immersive learning environments. Before I dive in, I do want to take a small step back, particularly from our customers in education. I often get the question, what is SharePoint? And that's a really fair question. SharePoint is a powerful product, but sometimes it can be a bit of a complicated product. So if I really boil it down, SharePoint is your organization's site builder. And there's two kinds of sites you can have with SharePoint. The first is a team site, which as the name suggests, is intended for teamwork and collaboration. Every team in Microsoft Teams has an associated SharePoint site. Many of you are already aware this site is where your team files live. So if you go to the files tab in a team, you can see an open in SharePoint option there. Click on it and it takes you into the document library of that team site. SharePoint also has another kind of site called communication sites. Now, these are standalone sites unrelated to Teams or O365 groups. And again, as their name suggests, they are intended for communicating broadly across an organization. So communication sites are typically built and maintained by a small handful of people, but these sites have a large number of visitors that come to them for information. So now that we're all on the same page, we'll dive into that first use case I was talking about, which is SharePoint site templates built for education. So we recently delivered three site templates in the SharePoint lookbook, and I'll give you a demo of all of this in just a couple of minutes. Each of those templates have been designed with a specific scope and audience in mind. So I'll start with the school homepage. Now this is built on that standalone communication site. It's intended to be sort of your institution's uh, internal landing experience for students and staff where folks can come and learn about uh, school wide news, events, uh, announcements and more. Then we have a staff homepage. Now this template is intended to be applied onto the team site that backs a staff team or a PLC team. And it serves as the place where staff members can find important documents, calls to actions, links to resources and other tools, etc. And then finally, there is a class homepage template, and this one is intended to be used on, uh, intended to be applied to the team site that backs a class team. And this is where, you know, students can come and learn about what is this class about, what are the important class materials, links to resources, events, and more. Uh, so with that, I will jump right into a demo. Here we are in Teams for Education. 
and uh, we have this one class called physical science. So if I go in, you can see that in the tabs up here, we have a home page tab that's been added. And this is in fact that uh, class home page that's been pinned as a tab within the context of the team with a little bit about the class, class materials, quick links, events, uh, you know, class news, some stream videos, and a little bit about the instructor as well. And this sits right alongside assignments and online meetings and conversations. Similarly, if I go to the uh, Pineview School staff team, here too, I have a home page tab that has been pinned. So this is that staff home page, uh, and you can see uh, upcoming events, a highlighted file, countdown timer, people, news. And so this is the staff home page that sits alongside all of the other capabilities inside Teams. So with that, let me jump to the lookbook, which is where I said these templates are available to show you how you can add them to your organization. By the way, I do also want to add that all of these templates are available for you today and you can use them entirely free um, at your organization. So you should absolutely leverage these. So this is this is the lookbook and in the lookbook we have various SharePoint site templates that have been organized by a category. So there's, you know, organization, department, community, and then we recently added the schools category. And this is where you can see those three site templates that I mentioned. So let's first look at the school homepage. Essentially, you click in and you go to the details page. And here you can see what this template is about, site features that have been included, web parts that have been included, sample content, and you can say add to your tenant. So this takes you to the next page where all you need to do is sort of provide the um, URL where you want this site to be provisioned or added and hit provision and in a matter of about five minutes this template gets added to your tenant and it started provisioning it's going to take about five minutes when it's completed i'm going to get an email that you know the site has now been added i do also want to go back to the lookbook and show you the provisioning flow for the class homepage or the staff homepage because those being built on team sites like i mentioned the provisioning flow is a little bit different so let's go back down here go to schools i'll show you um, the class homepage flow and it's going to be similar for the staff homepage as well so again tells you about the template uh, site features web parts you know what are the sample content um, and then you can say add to your tenant the difference you'll see here is it tells you you must provide the URL of an existing class team site. And there's a learn more link here and here that actually takes you to our extensive documentation that tells you exactly what that means and how you can find that URL. But just to demo that for you as well. So essentially, if you go into Teams and then you identify the class for which you want to add that class homepage, or for the staff homepage, you'd need to identify the staff team or the PLC team where you want to uh, add that homepage. And so since we are adding the class homepage here, let's look at physical science. Um, and then from the posts tab, if you go to the ellipses, you have an open in SharePoint option here. Alternatively, if you go to the files tab, you also get an open in SharePoint option right here. So when you click on either of those, it actually takes you to the document library of that associated SharePoint site. And then you need to click on the site logo. Right there, and that takes you to the site homepage. And well, in this site, I've already applied the template, so that's what you see here. But this is the URL that you want to grab. You want to go to the homepage of your class team or your staff team and grab that URL because that is where the template will be provisioned. So at this point, you know, you go back to the provisioning service or the lookbook, paste the URL in, and it just validates the URL to make sure that it is an existing class site in your tenant. Hit OK, hit add to your site. And again, in five minutes, the template will be provisioned. So five minutes is not a very long time, but time is of the essence in this session. So I have gone ahead and provisioned those templates beforehand to show you what that looks like. Um, I just showed you what the class template look, looks like. Um, you can see this is all of the stuff that's on it. Uh, we also have that staff template. Um, I did an overview for you inside Teams. 
this is it. And then we have the school homepage and uh, this is what that looks like. So you have important school resources, additional resources. You can have a message from a school leader, uh, school news, upcoming events, and then something with the school mission along with aligned sort of opportunities and initiatives at the school. And of course you can have navigation and a footer here with all sorts of branding and your school colors that have been expressed in this homepage as well. Now at this point I want to take a few minutes to just show you how easy authoring is in SharePoint. And what I mean by that is once you have sort of provisioned or added this template into your organization, it's really easy for you to customize it and make it your own. And our guidance documentation, which I'll give you an AKA uh, MS link to, and it's also linked from the lookbook itself. Our guidance documentation has step by step sort of guidance on how you can go ahead and customize each of these three templates. But to customize the page, you need to go into edit mode. So just click on edit in the command bar. And now this home page is in edit mode. So SharePoint pages are essentially comprised of sections on which we have web parts. So this topmost section is a one third right section and it has a neutral background selected and you can see I can change the background around as well, but I'll go back to neutral, which is what the template came with. And so on that template, we have these web parts that have been laid out, right? Like in that top, uh, to one third right section. We have a quick links web part up here, a call to action web part here and an events web part here. And in the template, these web parts have placeholder content and you just need to go in and sort of swap out the content with stuff that's relevant for your team or your organization. So for example, in this quick links web part, you know, we have one placeholder link for HR resources. So say you want this to be something else, right? You might want this to be like the attendance tool. Go ahead and change that. You can change the link up here. You can change the icon to something that's actually relevant for the link that uh, you know this button is pointing to. Uh, we provide a very large icon library that you can um, pick from, as you can see here, or you can provide a custom image to go on the on the button right here. Similarly, with the call to action web part, you know, it has some placeholder content, but all you need to do is change the button label. You can change the background to be something different, change the link that that button points to. So just go in, swap out the placeholder content for stuff that's relevant for you. The other thing too is some of the stuff that we've provided in the template may not be relevant for you. For example, you might not want to have a staff directory on the home page of your staff team. That's not a problem. Just go ahead and delete the web part. By the way, um, undo and redo in SharePoint authoring is really easy, so I can just hit Control Z, bring it right back. But in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and delete it. Additionally, I'll take this opportunity to show you how you can add a new web part that perhaps didn't come with the template, but after looking at the template, you think hmm, would be nice to add this somewhere. Um, just click on plus. And this pulls up our web part toolbox. These are all of the web parts that are available to you. Uh, you can also have custom web parts that have been built for your organization and that shows up here as well. Um, so. Say I pick the text web part. I can say hi, hello. I'm just putting in random text right now um, just to demonstrate this to you. And then there's uh, lots of different editing options. This is essentially a rich text editor that you've added onto the canvas. So you can change the formatting, change the font color, change the alignment, insert a table if you want, like do lots of different things. But uh, let me go ahead and delete this and instead perhaps what you might want to do is have this news web part that's over here occupy the entire section. No problem. Just go ahead and hit edit section. And make this a one column section and you can see this news just reflows beautifully to occupy the whole space. So when you're ready with how you've customized this site, you can go ahead and hit republish. I'm not going to do that because I wasn't super mindful about the changes I made right now. I was trying to just demonstrate to you how straightforward and simple 
page authoring in SharePoint is. So I'm going to go ahead and discard these changes, but I hope you get the get the point of how easy it would be once you add this template to just customize it and make it your own. Now, once you've done that, you do want to bring it into your Teams experience. So I'll go back to Teams now. Let's go back to the staff uh, team because I was demoing the staff site. So you can see we've already added that staff homepage here. And the way we did it was fairly simple. I'll add another tab with the same homepage to demonstrate this to you. You can say add a tab and then look for SharePoint. And essentially at this point, it pulls up all of the pages that are in that associated underlying team site. So all you need to do is find home and click on it and hit save. And when I do that, that home page gets pinned to my team. Similarly, for a class team, if you wanted to add that home page within the context of your team, you would have to do exactly the same thing. And then, of course, you can right click and rename this if you want. Now, I will also mention here that that school home page was built on a communication site, so it isn't associated with the team, right? So you can't look for SharePoint and pull in one of the site assets because the the school home page is unrelated to this team, but you can still bring it into teams. Manny already mentioned there's a way to pin communication sites or portals as a tab in the team left rail. The other thing you can do if you want to add it as a tab within um, a channel is by saying add a tab. And then look for website. And then let's go grab the URL of this school homepage. So. And paste it in here. And when you do that, the school portal, the school homepage is also available as a tab within the context of your team. Uh, so you can stay up to date on the happenings of your institution just alongside your online meetings and conversations and all of the other apps that you have just within the team's experience, never having to leave team. So with that now I'll jump back to my slide. I have an example here of how each of those three templates have been customized for higher education just by sort of changing the branding, which again we have instructions in our guidance doc by sort of uh, changing the placeholder content to content that's actually relevant for you and by changing the text. Um, you know, you can just make this site your own very easily. So the calls to action are number one, check out the lookbook. Uh, go to lookbook.microsoft.com. These templates are available for you to today and free. And uh, our guidance docs linked from the lookbook as well are available at aka.ms slash edu sites docs. Uh, these contain step by step guidance on provisioning the templates, then customizing them and then bringing them into teams. So with that, I'll switch over now to the next topic, which is SharePoint Spaces. Now SharePoint Spaces, this is a bit of a transition from the prior uh, templates uh, topic we were talking about, but not really because SharePoint Spaces enables you to create these great mixed reality learning environments with the same ease and familiar controls as authoring those 2D pages with the home pages as we were just seeing, and I'm going to demo that for you. And you can bring in all sorts of 3D content into your spaces, including 360 images, 360 video, um, CAD models and more. If you have headsets, that's a really compelling way to engage with spaces, but you don't need headsets. Uh, a browser experience is very beautiful and compelling. In fact, in our demos today, we are going to be both authoring as well as engaging with spaces just through the browser. And finally, you need no coding experience to leverage SharePoint spaces. So let me now jump into a demo of that. Here I am inside Teams and we have a sciences uh, class team. And you can see there's a tab here for the Tatouche Avalanche terrain. And this is actually a space. It's a SharePoint space. And you know, we have material here that's relevant for my learning with 360 images. There is a heat map over here, as you can see, and a 3D map model right here, 
with 360 images placed in the right positions in the map. In fact, if I click on any one of them, I am taken right into that 360 image. And you can see we've been able to annotate parts of the image. So this peak is called the castle. This is the pinnacle peak. There's another 360 image here to the upper ridge. So if I click on that, I am taken further into this really immersive uh, environment with sort of more annotations, more 360 images for me to go into. This is just a really engaging way uh, to sort of share learning content with students. Um, I can go back to the starting point of that space as well by closing the door. So we're back at that starting point here. So now let me show you how you can easily sort of author and build this space. You can click on the go to website option. And this takes you into the, share, the SharePoint site. So this is in that backing team site uh, where the space was built up. And I think you'll already see this is beginning to look very similar to the page, right? So essentially you click on edit. And now your space is in edit mode. And you will see that this is a 3D object web part. These are 360 image web parts. So for example, for this one, remember this was the 360 image that I went into. There is an action that has been configured that says on trigger, enter the 360 image. If you would like to add a web part somewhere here, uh, you can click on the very familiar plus icon that we just saw from page authoring earlier. This pulls up the web part toolbox again, shows me all of the web parts available for spaces. So for example, I might want to add a 3D object. You know, I find a location for it. And then these are all of the sources I can use, including 3D catalog. We provide a number of 3D models for you to bring into your spaces um, for free. So I might want to look at geology, you know, add one of these um, models. We also did go into one of these 360 images, so let me give you a preview into how that was done. I can say open tour builder and that takes me into the, the 3D image. I think you'll remember I was looking at this annotation and that annotation. I might want to add another annotation here, so just hit plus. I can annotate this image with all of these different things or link to another 360 image that continues the tour. And when I'm ready, as with that home page template that I showed you, all I need to do is click on republish. Um, before I do that, I just remembered there's also something else you can do here, which is uh, edit and change the structure of the space that all of this sits in. So if I click on space design, you can see this currently sits in a terrace structure, which is a somewhat simple structure to go with, but you can make it more um, exciting if you'd like. Uh, you can pick a geodome structure, and so this is what that would look like. It's taking a second to build, and I think that's because of my internet connection, which hasn't been great so far. Um, or you can pick an arch, an amphitheater, as far as the background, currently it's uh, an illustration background has been selected, but you know you can go with a solid color if you want to keep it really simple. You can go with image. We provide a number of beautiful nature images for you to add as a background for your space. Um, or you can provide your own custom 360 file, and of course the options with that are absolutely limitless. And when you're ready, just go ahead and republish. Now spaces are already available for you to use. And again, this is available to you at no additional cost, but you do need to enable it for all of the sites you want to use it in. So the way to do that is the sites have a settings gear on the top right. And go to site information. And then from here, go to view all site settings. And then under site actions, you have the option to manage site features. So these are a number of features that your site uh, could have if you wanted to activate them. I'm just going to search for space. So you can see spaces have been activated for this site, uh, but this is where you need to go into your sites and just make sure that spaces have been activated. And once you do that, 
Let's go back to the site home page. Again, you just click on the site logo to do that and it takes you to the site home page. All you need to do is when you click on new, space becomes an option for you. So this is how you start creating a space in that team site, in that class team site. Um, you know, give it an initial structure. Of course, you can update this later if you wanted to. So, you know, let's pick Geodome, which is my favorite. Give it a name, give it a description and just create it. And then, of course, you can build it up with those web parts that I showed you earlier. Again, how do you bring it into Teams? Go to the channel where you want to add it. Click on plus. And then select SharePoint again. And these spaces are essentially built on pages, right? In that underlying site. So just select the page you want to add. Uh, there's two of almost the same here because I was trying it out on a different page as well. But you select the one you want to add and then just hit save. And that space gets added as a tab inside Teams. So again, this is something that you should absolutely go try out today. Uh, I think I'm almost at time now, so I'll wrap up now. Both SharePoint site templates and spaces are available for you today, and uh, I hope you give them a shot. Again, everyone, this is Max Fritz here. Uh, helped start out the day, and I will be closing out the day with you here today with our final topic of professional development resources. And here at the end of the day, we're going to take a look at a few resources that can help make your life a little easier, help train your staff and students. We really want to help you effectively scale the efforts that you have to put in to help make school happen and take the things that you've learned from today and kind of use that as a launching board to get to your next steps. We have tons of resources for you guys around everything that you could imagine, including configuring teams, helping staff and students, learning, training, all sorts of things like that. So we're gonna cover those today, uh, show you a few places that you should put in your tool belt as go-to places and things that'll help you get your work done. So three key resources that we're gonna look at as IT pros, starting with Microsoft Teams University. Microsoft Teams University is a great resource. So it will pop up here in just a moment and there are links in these slides. It's gonna give you access to a lot of resources for higher ed and links to access this is for K-12 as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up Microsoft Teams University and show you what we can do within there. So right here, you're looking at Microsoft Teams University. You can get there easily by going to education.microsoft.com and clicking on Teams University. At the top of the screen, we've got resources for educators, students, and researchers. So not just for IT Pro, but this is your go-to place to get the resources that you need. If I scroll down below though, this is where I want you to focus for adopting Microsoft Teams. In here, you can see webinars like the one we're in today, um, team scenario libraries that help really show you in quick videos how teams can be used, but you've learned a lot of that today. What I want to show you specifically is some of the setup guidance that we can jump into here. So if I click on IT admin setup guide, it's going to open up a docs article, which is our, our location where everything is to uh, get stuff done from Microsoft and administrator perspective. And this is going to walk you through some of the basics to getting teams rolled out. Now you learned a lot of this today and yesterday, but this is gonna help walk you through step by step by step, the key components we see everybody needing to do to deploy teams successfully. What's gonna take you even deeper though, is this frequently asked questions for Teams Education Admin. This is gonna jump you into all sorts of things that we constantly are helping customers with, a lot of the things that you guys asked about yesterday and today, and that we covered. Some of the stuff that Nick covered yesterday, such as governance of creating teams, naming policies, things like that. Some of the automation topics that we talked about and the template topics, those are all gonna be here. For example, if you remember yesterday, I talked to you about how you can automate using PowerShell or Graph. And here we're gonna show you very detailed exactly how you can do that with links to the different places you can go for that. So be sure to check out these resources. They're great places to get started. And know that we also have Teams IT Pro on-demand courses for you that you can jump into at any time. And this is a part of what we call Microsoft Learn. Now, outside of Teams for Education, Microsoft Learn is a great site. I'll even open up the, the home learn site here. Learn.microsoft.com will bring you to this location where you can set up your own learning path, learn on your own schedule, and even get certifications and badges. 
But what we're particularly looking at here is how to manage team collaboration with Microsoft Teams. And it walks you through a few different modules. You can see this is two hours and 17 minutes estimated with five modules self-paced. And once you do this, you will get a badge that you can add into your linked profile. And you should be prepared to take our Teams Administrator Associate certification to further your career and help out your school even better. So we covered in there Teams University, Teams Admin Training, which is linked from there, and Microsoft Learn. The other area that I want you guys to see is our adoption guide, which you can also find at the Teams University link. We'll pop this open in a second, but the adoption guide walks you through what is going to be really helpful in a structured approach to really enable your students and your teachers uh, and your administrators and everyone in the school to adopt Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams. So again, to get to this, we're going to go back to Teams University. So I'll go back to my Teams University site. And right here, you can see our adoption resources. If I open up this adoption hub, it's gonna take me to that adoption guide that we were just looking at, where I can scroll through here and find more and more information. And here's the fantastic thing about everything that I'm showing you is that we have teams dedicated to keeping all of this stuff up to date as we roll out new features. So even in some of these docs articles, you can see when they were made, when they were updated. This one even was updated just about two months ago, and I'm sure it's going to be updated again soon. The next resource to take a look at is Microsoft Teams Online Interactive Demos. If you find yourself wanting to be able to provide demos to your educators, to your students, to your administrators, to anybody, this is a great place to go and to learn some yourself. So if we click on this Interactive Demos link, which I've already got up here in the background, you'll get to this link. And you've got four demo options today. Literally two months ago, there were two demo options, and we'll keep building this out further for you that help walk you through demoing different areas of Teams. For example, uh, we've got ones that are available for parents and guardians, really helpful for the uh, K-12 audience, where if I click Start Tour on here, it's going to literally put us through an interactive tour of where to click to do the entire Teams experience. It's going to mimic signing in, us clicking the Teams button, and then it's going to walk us through the interface and the different things we can do in Teams. Very similarly, we can do the same thing for our IT pro side for setting up and managing the school technology. If you want to relearn some of the stuff that we went through over the past couple of days and expound upon it. Again, that link is aka.ms slash edu dash interactive dash demos. And these slides will be published very shortly after I'm done here and available for you with all the links. Our overall Microsoft Education Center, where Microsoft Teams University lives, where all of our stuff lives is education.microsoft.com. If you really want to take a look at overall education resources, you definitely need to check out education.microsoft.com, which is our Microsoft Education Center. We also have a bunch of learning pathways there that are going to help you in all sorts of different scenarios, including some of the K-12 scenarios that we may not have jumped into as as far today. So different classroom technologies, assignments, things like that. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the best resource for getting help with Teams is actually inside of Teams. There is a help button in your Teams interface, which you can click at any time and anybody has access to, to get a, a range of videos, quick question and answer, and education-focused training for you. And it's worth showing this to you live here is my Microsoft Teams interface and an education tenant. If I click this help button, you'll see that I've got a few different options. We've got topics for you to explore, to learn more, general help, things like creating a class team and how to do it, what it, what it comes with, all those sorts of fun things, things for school leaders, remote learning. Oh, click the wrong link there. We've got training things built in here. So if you're thinking, I need to put together some training for my educators, quick videos, Take a look at what we've got here already, because again, we keep this up to date very, very, very frequently for you. So that it's there for you to utilize, to bring to your educators and your students. We've also got a quick what's new. So if you're wondering what's the latest stuff that's been rolled out in Teams, here you go. Here's our new preview meeting and calling experience with the pop-out windows with 7x7 seven seven coming and all that fun stuff we talked about earlier today. And we've got ways for you to get involved and talk to us including suggesting a feature, 
reporting a problem, giving us feedback, and interacting with our Microsoft Teams community. Now, our Microsoft Education Center, as we talked about before, we've got that aka.ms slash Teams University. We've also got aka.ms higher ed on MEC. So for you guys to get access to the higher ed content on that Microsoft Education Center, and one for remote learning. We've got ones for higher ed, for further ed, and all sorts of different areas, including K-12. Next area that you should totally check out, and this is at that Teams University site, is we actually have slide decks ready for you to use for leading your own trainings for staff and students. Whether you're gonna lead as an IT pro or a fellow staff member might lead it, it's a great resource for you to go check out. I will show you, um, I've got that open as well, of course. Uh, so it will bring you to this template, you download it, you customize it the way you want. A lot of the slides you probably even saw today, if you wanna take the great content that you learned today and bring it forward to the rest of your school or university. Now, last but not least, just wanted to, to drive home that Microsoft Education Center, great place to go, education.microsoft.com, that Teams University, aka.ms slash Teams University, lots of links, lots of stuff to remember. Don't forget the slides will be available and tons of courses to use for going through education specific features targeted at classroom collaborations and assignments. So we really help all of these services that we have available for you will help you guys take off from today and maximize the investment that you've made in Microsoft Teams to help learning become a core component of Microsoft and what you guys are trying to achieve. So with that, we are gonna wrap up today. Thank you guys for sticking with us. It has been a fantastic day. It's been fantastic two days to have you in the IT Pro Track. If you came to us from the teaching and learning and been hopping around, well, even, the, even better, the recordings are gonna be published. The slides are available. So today we covered a lot of different things. We went through some examples from institutions and what's new in Teams. We talked about our cybersecurity posture. We went through all sorts of app platform concepts in Teams, how to manage Teams apps, and how to use app templates for Teams. And we went through some wonderful experiences with SharePoint templates and SharePoint spaces to show how you can extend Teams with the other great applications within the Microsoft suite. We would really love for you guys to stay connected with us. We have a cohort available for you to join. It's aka.ms slash join Teams EDU community. It's where you can learn from other institutions, stay plugged in with us with the latest information, and share best practices that you've learned yourselves. Again, that's aka.ms slash join teams edu community. All of the slides very shortly after I'm done speaking here will be available at aka.ms slash teams edu live dash slides. I know if I say aka.ms one more time, right? Um, but they will be available for you guys to grab. We'd love for you to grab them. Presuming that you registered for today's event, you will be getting an email link with access to the recordings as well uh, shortly within the next day or two. And we would love for you to catch up and check out anything you missed, revisit any topics that interested you. Please feel free to interact with us, ask any more questions that you have in the Q&A. And I'd like to personally thank you on behalf of the entire Microsoft Teams Engineering Group for Education and all the wonderful folks who are presenting and moderating today. Thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great start to the school year.